Hello, everybody. Wow. I'm thrilled to see so many people here for the event tonight. Just so you all know, this lecture will be live, live streamed. There will be people connected to this lecture and watching it even outside of this auditorium. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Tim Riker. I'm a teacher here at Brown University. And it's funny because there's two signs for Brown, the color and then Brown University. But here we use Brown like the color. I teach ASL and Deaf Studies, and today I have the special honor to introduce Sanjay Gulati. Sanjay is a doctor at Cambridge. He works for Cambridge Health Alliance, abbreviated as CHA. He's worked there for over 20 years. And he set up a service to help deaf and hard of hearing students, excuse me, deaf and hard of hearing children. So now I'd like to welcome Sanjay. His lecture will be focused on language deprivation syndrome, a very important topic. And just as a disclaimer, we have already set up a system for Q&A. So if you have questions during the lecture, please wait to the end. Sanjay will lecture for about an hour, and then you may form a line so that you can speak your question into the microphone. The interpreter will interpret the question, and once um, Sanjay answers it, she will answer. The, she will speak the answer. This is so that for the live stream, everything is clear for anybody watching who may need to be, who may need to have access to assigned interpretation as well. So without further ado, here's Sanjay. Woo. What a nice audience. Thank you so much for coming everybody. I'm happy to be here today to talk about what I think is the most important issue in the deaf community today. I call it language deprivation syndrome. My, my sign language is not perfect. I was born hearing and I didn't learn ASL until I was 30. In fact, it's my third language. My second language is English. The first language that I learned between ages one and three, my L1, that's my native language, my strongest language. Later I learned English, English, and then I learned ASL at age 32. My signing is not perfect. Sometimes I might voice, sometimes I might sign. If something's unclear, please don't hesitate to ask for clarification. So do you see the picture in the background? A woman with serious language deprivation syndrome painted that picture in the background. I wanted to broadcast you here today for partially myself, really for all of us, who've seen that language deprivation is truly awful. It can lead to anger issues, depression, but sometimes it can bring a lot of joy as well. This woman who painted this was happy. When she lived with a deaf family for the first time, the families that she grew up with loved her and cared for her, but they did not give her access to communication. So that led to a lot of tantrums and problems, frustrations. But when she moved with the deaf family, a deaf household completely changed her. 
she became relaxed, happier. She painted and she put, she hung up her paintings with pride. I'm proud to say that I had the opportunity to interact with her and use her picture. But when I asked her about that, she didn't quite understand the concept. So I used the picture and I'm hoping that she'll be okay with that. With this picture, we see two things at the same time. We see the picture. And we see the signal. You see it with your eyes. You pick out two signals, in fact. There's signals with noise. And you see the picture with its light tones, the light intensities. And with that, the signal with your eye, the signal that is perceived with the eyes goes down and the noise intensity goes up. Now it's harder to see, right? The signal, the signal ratio gets complicated and it's not fun. Topics about the signal is one of many included in language deprivation. I'll do the best that I can to explain that but it's a very complex topic. I'm not claiming to be all knowledgeable, all powerful about language deprivation. There are many sub-disciplines included in language dep deprivation. Audiology, maybe surgery can be included in that as well. Conceptual scientists, even politics. Disability studies too, it's all involved. So when we look at the period, the picture now, you experience the same thing. We all experience a common experience. When I was born, I was hearing. I experienced hearing loss. 20 years ago, that's when I lost my hearing. I used hearing aids to hear. I had vocal training. It was hard work. This is an audiologist graph. It's very common in the field. It's how audiologists gauge how successful, how well your hearing works or in other words, doesn't work. Notice that the normal range per se is O. That's the average for adults. That's the average hearing. Excuse me, is 50. So the normal is 50. And I'll explain more about that, what that, mean, what that means later. Quote, unquote, normal. It goes down to serious hearing loss, which was me 20 years ago. And you can see how it varies in the chart. When my hearing aids were flipped up, the graph would go up. I would listen and match as closely as I could. I, could lis I would listen to water flowing in different stimuli. People who had normal hearing could listen to the water flowing and a, vo and a vocal stimulus. They were in the green range. When it was adjusted higher, the vocal range was toned down and the water became loud. Communication there was hindered by the water noise. Now, do hearing aids 
really cure deafness? No, they don't. No matter the ranges that you put them at. It will never truly move them to the green. It's just a tool, and that's what's important to remember. I don't really like showing audiologist graphs because that makes me seem like I believe that hearing is just about sound. And I don't believe that. Hearing is about language. For deaf and hard of hearing people, it's not about this. Deaf and hard of hearing people may have a harder time enjoying things that people with a strong L1 might enjoy. Make sense? Let me expand on that. There are deaf people who are like myself. They were born hearing. They have a strong spoken L1. And then there are people who were born deaf and they grew up deaf. They have a completely different experience. When we read books as deaf people who became deaf later in life, we learned how each word corresponded and we learned that speaking would lead to success. That's what I mean by success, having a good L1 in which you can speak well. A person who becomes deaf and later, deaf later in life, already has an established L1. That's just one of the benefits, that's, excuse me, that's an advantage that people who go deaf later in life have over deaf people who were born deaf. All right, let me see what page I'm on. Let's say a baby was born. A baby needs different needs. A baby needs different things. They need shelter, maybe vaccinations, a caring mom. But a baby also needs love, correct? And if you're lucky, you'll never have to see a picture from this awful experiment tested on Reese's monkeys who were taken away from their mom and given a pseudo mom. They had the choice between a wiry mom who had no fur but provided milk or a soft, cuddly mom but did not provide milk. It was really awful, quite, quite tragic. When the babies were stretched, the results found, stressed, the results found that the baby monkeys always chose the pseudo mom with cuddly fur, even though she did not have milk. The ones. Babies prefer touch over milk. If you leave the baby without a live mom, they'll die. If we look at blind babies, they show delayed development for mobility. It's not very obvious, but if you observe, you will see. For example, they'll flip over, they'll start to tone over at one year, when normally it's two months. They'll learn to walk at around two or three, normally it's a year. This means people who can see use visual information to learn how to move, which is strange. People don't normally expect that. For a blind baby, if you give them aid to develop their mobility, they develop on time. For babies who are born deaf, well, it's less serious. Compared to a blind baby, deaf babies can have serious problems with language, develop, which language dep deprivation.
A deaf baby born into a, a hearing family wants to communicate. They want to make natural attempts to communicate. They want to express their ideas. They want interactions. If a parent picks, if a parent pays attention to their baby, they'll pick this up. Parents may develop home signs to interact with their baby, but unfortunately, no matter how many home signs you develop, it's not the same as a strong L1. Let me explain what a full language is. Full languages have grammar. They have vocabulary as well. Grammar means what, how, with, what words, which meanings go with what. Vocabulary is just a database of words. English has lots of vocabulary. Maybe not as many gram grammatical rules as compared to other languages, but it's complex. Grammar and vocabulary are very different. Even though one list may be longer than the other one, it's important that they work together. For people with language deprivation, that connection between vocabulary and grammar is never made. Grammar is a word you've probably heard in school before. The rules of the right way to form sentences Blah, blah, blah. Well, that's not exactly what we linguists define as grammar. What we say when we mean grammar. Well, let me explain. Just a moment. Let me turn my page. It's very interesting. All people use language. Sure, there are variances, but we all have language. We all have specific and complex grammar. Most of us can communicate effortlessly. Sometimes there are problems in language that are related to other things, but in general, we, we communicate well with each other. In human evolution, language is very important. Without language, we could die. Well, maybe kill each other. Language is a part of life. So that statement that we know, language is used by every being. Let's look at deaf people about that. Deaf community, deaf people, we're human too. Deaf people don't have different requirements for life. Deaf or hearing, we need language. I want to share a story. This is my daughter. She's loony. Now she's four. Her name is Lucy, excuse me. She's four years old. My wife and I are raising her. We're her parents, of course. One day, we brought her a gift. It was a stuffed animal, and she named that animal Tasha. Tasha. 
One day she lo- she walked down the stairs and she forgot Tasha. She jumped down the stairs and she hit her head. It was awful. I was sitting watching the whole the whole ordeal. And even though I couldn't hear, I knew it was loud. She walked back up the stairs, grabbed Tasha, Tasha, and walked back down to me. Tasha said, sorry, you fell. Well, I drove home one day. My wife was looking at me. I was sitting, signing. She was looking at me. She said, Sanjay, did you say something about Tasha hitting her head and saying sorry? Those three signs are what I signed. Those three words have so much power. I want to expand on that idea. Words have power. Each word has power. Go ahead and take a moment to read this. Ready? Almost ready? Ready? All right. Next slide. This is an odd phrase. Theory of mind. It's the theory that other people have minds as well. They can feel, they have ideas, they have consciousness. This concept is very important for humanity. Theory of mind, T-O-M, is what we call it. Oh, next page. Imagine kids without language. They were born into a hearing family. And let's say the child has a stuffed animal. Same situation with Lucy. They fall down the stairs. What was that kid's experience? Trauma? Pain? There was an affection for the animal, but there's some missing. The theory of mind is missing. It's not conscious for the child without language. They can't imagine it because of the deprivation, deprivation, which means they may experience that again and again and again, thousands of times throughout their childhood. That experience will happen. Next slide. Notice this experience is internal and in our social surroundings. Socializing is very important. Hearing parents want their children to live with language because they want them to be able to connect with kids, to be involved and have friends, to have social skills. The problem with the delayed acquisition of your L1 is that you have a harder time learning to socialize as well. It's a really fascinating study. Conceptual scientist who's Italian named Elena Tomasorio. She had three groups of kids. 
One group went to a bilingual school. One group went to a school where kids spoke and they signed. Next slide. So looking back at Lucy's experience, her tumble down the stairs was both internal and social, which is very important. Socializing is very important. Parents want their kids to learn language so they can socialize and make connections with other kids. The problem with having a delayed acquisition of the L1 is that social life is affected as well. Up here is a fascinating study. This woman who conducted the study was Italian. She was a conceptual scientist. She had three groups of kids. One of them was the control group, regular speaking kids who can hear. One of them went to a bilingual school. And the other group were kids who they had some exposure to sign language, but they were mostly trained to speak. She measured each, each group's theory of mind. And what she found was shocking. I'm really going to enjoy showing you these results. And especially for the ENT doctors, I'm really going to enjoy showing you these results, especially because it shows how important the L1 is. The bilingual deaf kids had a strong L1. They had sign language, Italian sign language, of course. The kids who were mostly spoken to and had hearing aids and cochlear implants and a little bit of exposure of sign were delayed. The best theory of mine, kids, were the ones who were bilingual, could sign, and had access to uh, Italian as well. All right, next page, next slide. I'm going to show another important study. It's a Dutch study. It compared hearing Dutch kids with implanted deaf Dutch kids. And what the researchers found was truly shocking. Nobody expected such a strong conclusion. The deaf implanted kids seemed to have an okay language, not awful, but their theory of mind development was so delayed it wasn't even close to the hearing kids. All right, next slide. This is what I call vitamin L, aka language. Some people say vitamin H, but that's not true. It's your L1, your native language. For a long time, people theorized and, and wondered what would happen to kids without quote unquote vitamin L. How would that affect them? We knew the results were negative, but we allowed it to happen anyway. We abandoned the kids. We as in the researchers doing this. They wanted to see what kind of language they would develop if they didn't talk to them at all. And what we found was that the kids definitely did not speak Swedish. This is in, in, in Sweden, by the way. 
They did not talk. The kids themselves played together, laughed together. They had their own gestures. Really, that experiment showed what home signs looked like when they developed among kids, their communication and their ideas regarding that. Language deprivation, deprivation can happen with hearing people, but it doesn't happen as easily.